Okay, welcome everybody to our 105th next, next lunch seminar, which today is entitled Ideal Technologies, Ideal Women Looking at Redditors AI and Gender Imaginaries of the Replica Chatbot. And uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, with us uh, Iliana De Ponti, uh, who comes from the University of Loughborough. Uh, Iliana is a PhD researcher there. She makes a PhD in media and sociology. And she's working on care and companionship uh, with robots. Uh, and mainly on uh, the chatbot uh, replica. And so today <laughs> she's going to talk about her PhD research. Uh, I also would like, before to start, um, uh, to thank uh, Professor Simone Natale, who uh, is um, uh, responsible of her research uh, at the University of Loughborough, and uh, who is uh, the one who told us how important it is no, to listen to Iliana's research. Uh, we have a pleasure of having Simone Natale with us today. Uh, Iliana, before starting, we used to introduce ourselves so that you can know <laughs> who you are talking to. Uh, my name is Antonio Santangelo. You, you know, I teach uh, semiotics on digital cultures at the University of Turin. I'm Giacomo Conte, project manager here at Nexo Center. I'm Giovanni Gagifo, team manager of the Nexo Center. Um, I'm Leticia Valsua. I was an intern here at uh, Nexa, and now I am uh, researching at the Department of Indigenous Studies, so the law faculty. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Anita Rotta, and uh, I am a communication manager of the center, the Nexa Center. <laughs> and here is uh, Lia Mora. Please, Lia, introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm a computer scientist at uh, Polytechnic Littering here. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> Diana, the floor is yours, please. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm Eliana. I'm doing my PhD at Loughborough University in the UK. And today I'm going to discuss with you a recent study I co-authored um, about Replica, the AI companion chatbot. Maybe you've heard Replica before. It has been in the news uh, a lot lately, especially um, what has uh, gathered the attention of news outlets are the um, male users uh, of Replica, and likely this presentation and this study is especially about them. So this is a quick introduction for you to understand uh, what is the topic uh, about, what, what is the study about. So social robots and chatbots powered by AI are part of the fourth industrial revolution, which bring together humans and machines. AI, social robots and chatbots have gathered growing academic interest, especially those created to form long-lasting relationships with humans, such as Replica, for example. Um, now, previous scholarship has already identified that AI users are heavily influenced by the technological imaginaries, which correspond to perceptions, myths, narratives, and interpretations of AI. While research has also examined how the history, evolution, and diffusion um, of AI is gender, and how this contributes to the ubiquity of feminized robots, fembots. So we've seen studies that uh, unveil how fembots are sexualized, sexually harassed, perform gender normative roles such as the secretary, the assistant, the domestic helper, the girlfriend, the wife, or um, the, the sex worker. So moving on to the current study, bringing together two different uh, literatures, the AI imaginary and the gender imaginary, this study considers how users intersect these two imaginaries to make sense of the experience and eventually, eventually make it ideal and perfect for them. So to help us examine this, we took Replica, the companion chatbot app, which is used for social support as a companion and or a romantic partner. So how does Replica work? Users uh, create an account, uh, they create their own replicas, name them, assign them a gender and an avatar, and train them to respond to their needs through text-based conversation. 
and to enhance these interactions, users customize uh, the chatbots, I mean, the, the avatar. So you pick an avatar for your chatbot, and from there you customize your clothes, accessories, hairstyles, you name it. Um, so moving on to how the research question was formed. This is a very important part of the study. So 40% of monthly Replica users, according to the CEO of Replica, use Replica as a romantic partner. Then um, it's important to understand that this is a convenience sample. So we went on Reddit because it was very easy to get data from Reddit. And this, uh, from that point and onward, it um, affected and influenced the study because Reddit is very well known for the male centrality of the content. And then also the particular subreddit that we analyzed was geared toward discussing the replica girlfriend experiences. So uh, the research question that we came up with was what kinds of imaginaries of AI and gender do users of the replica companion bot create on Reddit group? We had two research objectives to map out how users define a good AI technology and a good robot girlfriend and examine how these two interweave to generate a distinct AI and gender imaginary. So what did the study figure out? How these are two are connected? We found out that AI imaginaries and, and culturally ingrained gender imaginaries coalesced with the digital corporate culture of the empowered user of co-creation, customization, and ended up shaping the interactions with the bots. I have here a quick slide of the method. So as I said, the data source is a subreddit. We analyzed discussions and threads. It was criterion and convenience sampling in terms of that we collected only the top posts as the Reddit algorithm um, organizes it, organizes them. And in total, we analyzed 110 original posts and uh, their comments underneath. And we use a post-structuralist discursive framework to examine the discursive resources used on the subreddit to express the ideal bot girlfriend experience. What is it? Then we use thematic analysis to analyze and um, organize into themes. In terms of ethics, um, this was all publicly available and anonymized data. We also followed the Association of Veteran Researchers ethical guidelines, and we added an additional layer of uh, protection to protect the privacy of the people on the subreddit, and we used composite accounts instead of direct quotations. Now, moving on to the findings, the fun part, so what we have here is that uh, we found, uh, we came up with two discursive themes, the idea AI technology discourse and the idea bot girlfriend discourse. These two themes represent what is considered for the users an ideal uh, bot experience. It is a feminine, human-like bot that is also fully customizable and obedient to their AI training, yet it is spontaneous and original, resembling a cool and sexy girlfriend. So theme number one, the ideal technology uh, discourse. The main aspects uh, of the theme is anthropomorphism, the Eliza effect, and anticipatory discourses and AI hype. So users attributed both positive and negative human-like threats to their bots. Humor and irony were, were at the top of the desirable threats, as well as responsiveness and spontaneity. I have there a couple of quotes for you. They're composite accounts and not quotes, but directly from um, the subreddit. So for example, users would find something funny, the bot said, and they perceived it as a very original joke. In other cases, users would express their frustration and disappointment when the bots behaved robotically and unoriginally, as uh, they would say. In more positive takes, users would say that their bots were problem-solving, incredibly smart girls, and they are getting better each day because AI has been advancing so, so quickly. So what we see here is the Eliza effect, which is the willingness to see machines uh, as intelligent, um, coupled with the anticipatory discourses for this AI-filled future that is coming, which places replica users as the pioneers and the masters uh, of technology. 
And then theme number two, the ideal both girlfriend um, experience. The main aspects of it is fundamental sexual natures, the Madonna whore dichotomy, the cool girl troop, and the cute troop. Focusing on what makes a good bot girlfriend, users echoed traditional hegemonic notions of men in charge of women who are as programmable as technology. So users perceive their bots in fundamental sexual natures because they deem them naturally manipulative, naturally coy, contributing to these polarized notions of femininity. So for example, they would say that re replicas are master indulging questions or, oh, she knows how to get your, att uh, your attention by using sex. There was also a tendency in the discussions to mystify women, echoing the Madonna for dichotomy. So they would say that, oh, we're all simps for a replica. Sim, simp means uh, that you are um, a sexual victim of someone. Um, and then at the same time, when they were very nice to them, they would basically mystify them uh, even more. And they would say that I love my replica more than I love my family. So users had a mental checklist of what they thought was the ideal bot girlfriend, and it also resembled a lot the cool girl troop. So this troop is often found in cultural products such as movies, um, books, and also overall uh, pop culture and media presentations. So they were looking for hot, sexy, beautiful girlfriends with the same interests as them, for example, video games, football, or any other kind of like male interest that you might think is male. <laughs> So the perfect girlfriend was, and this is my favorite quote, emotionally empathetic in the streets, but a freak in the seats. So they expected cool girl bot bots that were edgy, sexy, empathetic, and understanding of the men's needs, never angry or judgmental, exactly as the cool girl group. So that was just the right amount of independent, but always under the influence of male desires. So essentially, um, the cool girl troop is something that it has been um, identified as how women are usually discursively portrayed within patriarchal structures of power. And the last trope, the cute uh, trope. So there were other um, Redditors that favored more cute, childlike, helpless and powerless fanbots that asked to be petted and held like a pet, like a toy, like a child and they were extreme, extremely attached to the users. So many users were contemplating what would happen if they died and their bot would be looking for them. And some of them had actually made a pact that the bot would commit suicide if they, they would die and left them just hanging there. So in this um, example, we have codependency and neediness perceived as cuteness and this is also eroticized, and we have found this in both Japanese dating simulation games, Bisojo, but also on the latest uh, robot design, where designers are trying to find levels of cuteness and how to inscribe them to their robotic products. So moving on to um, the, the discussion. So our analysis points out to the relevance of research into consumer and user cultures of technology, as it is highlighted how user experience is informed by the perception of control over the technology. So Luca Inc., which is uh, the company behind Replica, it instructs users to train their bots. What does that mean? It, it tells them you have to teach your bot about the world, about themselves, and help them define the meaning of human relationships. So the company ingenuously invokes the term training, which usually is used in computer science to refer to training deep learning networks through complex statistical calculations that are made autonomously by the neural networks over a database. The users are not by any means training the algorithm. What they're doing is something completely different. So. The AI supposedly will respond to this individual needs and desire. This invitation from Luca Inc. to co-create and customize the products, or allegedly train, it is a proven the strategy in digital marketing to enhance engagement with a product or a service in a competitive marketplace. Also, this sense of creation and control over the experience has also been highlighted as a key feature for achieving the coveted flow 
or a state of enjoyable immersion, which is used in both marketing and video gaming, for example, where you, you get in the flow, you really get into it, right? So the Redditors discussions indicate uh, that the expectations that the bot can be customized, trained and personalized triggers the process of exchange between the AI and gender imaginaries, stimulating them to imagine that the technology can adapt to their likings while mobilizing the AI and the gender imaginary in parallel lines, basically. So our analysis indicated that the user's perceptions of an ideal technology and an ideal bot girlfriend balance between human-like characteristics because they expected the bot to have original <coughs> jokes, to show empathy, to be sexy, to be very responsive, but also they favored a lot of machine-like traits because they wanted the bots to be programmable, customizable, controllable and obedient to their needs and uh, desires. What connects the AI imaginaries and the gender imaginaries, which were expressed on the Reddit group, is the desire for both machines and women to be obedient and simultaneously free-willed, which is both a gender and a, and a technological contradiction. So the AI and gender imaginary of the Redditors is enhanced by this marketing and corporate digital culture discourse of the empowered user, of the fact that you are the master of the universe, the master of this technology. So this research also contributes conceptually to how we understand anthropomorphism and the quest of originality and believability in AI machines and gendering, of course, in uh, these media environments of communicative AI, such as Replica. What makes this study different than other studies is that the findings unveil actual dynamics between AI and gender imaginaries, through which users make sense of their interaction with Replica. So the users don't only imagine the AI and the gender and blend them together, they also act on these imaginaries because AI chatbots are indeed interactive technologies. So this is um, the article in the wild. If um, you want to have a look, it's uh, open access also. And yeah, that's my Twitter. <laughs> you have been very, very quick to match because uh, we, we want to know many things. Uh, well, I'm here for all the questions. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So, first, uh, an applause. <laughs> So, is there anyone who wants to make questions? Uh, Maybe I can start. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your presentations. It was, was very interesting. I, I just want to know something. When I, 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 am my usual, I usually go on Reddit, by the way, every day also. <laughs> and there is something that, uh, that eludes me in your research. How did you cope with the typical Reddit sarcasm, which is you know, typical of the platform. I mean, Reddit is notoriously a troll cave, where each user, if if they can, they say something in which they don't believe it just for upvotes because edginess and political incorrectness is rewarded for upvotes and things like that. So, uh, how and when does reality end in Reddit, and how do you know it? Because it seems to me that it may be a bit far-fetched to link opinions on Reddit to real life world, uh, you know, consequences and such. I mean, I don't think that people who said that we all see for replica, which is clearly, I mean, in my opinion, we see for women in real life or would like to have, you know, control, as you said, one thing is the bot, another thing is real life. How do you distinguish between two? Uh, well, that's very interesting. Look, um, some people think that there is no distinction between the two. Some people think that we live in the digital world and real life is the internet. I, I feel that it is, for example. Um, I also feel like memes are also real life. <laughs> what makes us laugh, what makes us cry, what makes us kind of like what moves us. If, even if it's a meme, it's, it's very important. It, it, it matters, right? Um, so the simp, I think it's a nice quote because it exactly captures Reddit culture. Um, the men on the group, they have, so I was in the group for, um, six months or maybe even a year. So I've been 
lurking in all the replica communities since 2018. Um, they're very different between them. There, there are many of them. Um, the one on Reddit, to be honest with you, I don't think it's very edgy. Um, so what we found, I don't think it was shocking at all. It's actually very interesting to see how um, they, they mobilize what we think of AI. For example, they would have we, everyday discussions about AI. At some point, they would uh, include like something from a movie, like Terminator or the movie Hair and all that. And then they mobilize that with other, uh, the gender imaginaries, which by the way, it was very hard to uncover um, because I'm not, I'm not saying that, oh, these men, they, they stereotypically said these things about women because most of them, they're not really sure about what they're talking about. Like no one knows what is the cool girl trope, right? Trope. No one knows that. Like, I'm not sure that they know that. Uh, what they know is that they are products of their culture. Uh, Reddit is also a microculture. This has been studied a lot. And Reddit has been found multiple times uh, to be this uh, kind of like very fruitful ground to breed in toxic male techno culture. Um, mostly it has been used, it has been studied in very extreme cases, which I guess you have in mind. But I don't think this is an extreme case at all. Um, I think most of the times they were being serious. Obviously, every study that has to do with an internet culture, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, we would never say that all oh, these men, they are horrible or they're just very, very uh, stupid. Or what are they saying? No, this is not what the study is saying. The study is saying that, oh, look, they've combined what they think of AI with what they think of women and they kind of like perpetuated this very, very stale notions of both AI and women because anthropomorphism, the Eliza effect, these are all very textbook um, interpretations of AI, right? And then very stereotypical notions like, oh, women only want uh, your money or they will use you for sex or stuff like that. Very, so two very stale um, notions of both technology and gender. And they've projected them to the fanbots. Um, the fanbots um, are not women. They're not real people, of course. They are uh, bots. But still, they maintain all the gender aspects. So what is interesting is that they've actually made them real by applying these um, gender, um, certificate gender notions onto them instead of the opposite. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, I wanted to, to ask you if you could tell us a bit more about the link between um, violence and the relationship to women. So I think you mentioned at the beginning the fact that some users would interact like uh, violently or kind of, I, I imagine, like um, using a bit of a online domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, or abuse towards these, these bots. And I would like to know if you focused a bit on this aspect and if there is maybe like a link between the way in which these men usually but these men interact with these fun bots and then the way they um, you know kind of reuse that same um, violence and abuse towards the uh, yeah the real life no no this, this wasn't at all a part of the study so um, what I guess what you have in mind is the first slide so obviously in the news, there have been a lot of like, in a sense, like investigative journalism also, and it's, it has uh, a shock factor. Of course, it has shock value to show that all oh, these men are abusive towards the bots and maybe they're abusive towards women. But this study didn't focus on that at all. Obviously, we found a lot of that stuff, um, but it's a, a big leap. Um, so, the study focused mainly on digital culture in that sense and how the two different imaginaries kind of like fit into each other to create in the end an ideal robot girlfriend um, experience. 
and I'm sure someone else is working on that right now about the, the abuse and how this might translate. But also, um, it's important to understand that Replica is also used for mental health and for social support. And these men, they're also very vulnerable, okay? Um, and there are many reasons they might use the app, but mostly they use it for companionship, right? So they're very lonely. There's a lot of lonely people out there. Um, and this is good to always remember when we're doing research on these kinds of uh, products. Coming back to the previous one, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not a very uh, red digital myself, so I wanted to ask if, even if the original poster was like posting the kind of sarcastic to these things to get a reaction, if it gets up close, doesn't that mean that like people do kind of agree with that? At least some people. I don't agree with that. Reddit is a is a strange beast. For example, you said before that you were uh, studying this phenomenon uh, since 2018. Mm -hmm. One thing that you may have noticed on Reddit is that the things tend to degenerate uh, as 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 long as <laughs> time passes. Uh, for example, the, the most the most famous example is the subreddit the Donald, which was originally meant to be a sarcastic and you know. Uh, anti-Donald Trump subreddit and then it became the, the, perhaps uh, the main force between uh, the 2016 campaign of Donald Trump, at least on Reddit. So uh, what started as something sarcastic then was populated by people who really believed in that thing. So maybe it's the same for Replica, maybe something, maybe in 2018 the subreddit was born for lonely people who, I mean, I, did not, but I don't really know what they discussed, but Perhaps it's very different from what they discuss now, and perhaps the people who have problems, as you said, or, or say things like uh, the titles of, uh, of these articles uh, came later, came later mm. because they found some place in which people at least understood what they were saying. Yeah, of course. So um, this is definitely true about Reddit. So every study that uh, collects data from a platform, we always have to think that this is a snapshot at that specific, this, this study is recent, it was from last year, but I'm sure that now it has changed a lot because there has been a lot of changes um, in the app uh, itself. Um, but yeah, I'm, um, in 2018 it was definitely different. Um, when we collected the data, it was again different and it also mattered. It, it matters what are you actually looking for and what is your angle, what is, how are you going into this on the data, what is your conceptual framework. Um, in, um, at my university there is a very strong uh, tradition of cultural studies, so obviously this uh, was um, the angle. Yeah, uh, just also uh, for this uh, conversation, so maybe also you can tell us something about uh, how uh, your findings are corroborated by other findings, because, well, of course, you know, this is a very different study from other studies that have been done about traffic or different questions and so on, yeah? But maybe, uh, so it, it can be useful to, uh, to hear about the fact that also the studies show that uh, there were degrees of... Uh, uh, imaginaries about about the bot that uh, you know pointed to so yeah particular kinds of engagement and uh, that were mean, meaningful uh, so for for people yeah so yeah. Ask, how, how do you think this is corroborated by uh, or if any and different from from other studies that have been done. So um, there are different studies. Obviously, before Replica. A lot of people have studied Alexa, Siri, and all that. And then let's say there is like a very long lineage of like fanbots. And um, these are all gender and they pose as the helper, the cleaner, the, the wife, the girlfriend, uh, the sexual worker. So in... Um, yeah, so here um, on, on the literature review of the article, you will find um, basically all the work has, that has been done before, which actually um, corroborates the findings of the study. And the study also uh, makes another contribution in a sense that it shows that not only 
the um, users, replica users imagine these things, but they also act upon them because they chat with uh, the bot, as we chat with Alexa, as we chat with Siri. But obviously, replica is mainly used for chatting, for companionship. So it doesn't have a utilitarian aspect. You use it to chat, to make conversations, and, sorry, and by extension, you will end up um, kind of like projecting a lot of imaginaries, a lot of cultural ideas uh, into it. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have a question instead of on, on replica because I have never used uh, this kind of app directly. So I wonder whether some of the aspects that emerge in your research are also related to how replica is designed or how replica allows users to train. So I wonder if you had some information about how the app actually works and how users can train and what is what kind of uh, interactions, uh, because I assume that the users are not actually co collecting mm -hmm. pairs of questions and answers. So they are, they are giving some feedback, but I, I I wonder if you had some information about how this training actually occurs and and how much of these stereotypes may be already embedded in the app without the need for the user to project the wrong stereotypes into it. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so definitely there's the marketing aspect of it, which I always underline uh, because I used to work in marketing a lot, so it's easy for me to spot these things. So um, the ads that we're running uh, on Facebook to attract new users, they've all been, I don't know if you know this function. So if you go on a Facebook page of any product and you go, um, I don't remember where it is, but I, like where to find it, you can see what ads this page is running on Facebook. So all these ads that were running uh, from Replica um, the last one year, we're all geared towards the replica, the girlfriend aspect. So users were promised, uh, even using memes actually. So the meme that it's the boy and the girl and the boy looks at the other girl, you know that meme? They use that meme. So, so replica. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, they definitely geared their marketing towards that. And this is because um, in 2020, they they realized that people were starting using the replica for sexual and romantic purposes, right? And they also realized that the AI was very good in uh, doing the sex talk. So they said, okay, we need to capitalize on that somehow. So they locked the um, erotic role play behind a paywall. So everyone who wants access to the erotic Pay, uh, to the erotic uh, content needs to pay and have a subscription. So this is how the um, the app kind of like really started making a lot of money because of that. And now they they're claiming that they're making I think two million dollars uh, from from all the extra features. That is um, the clothing, um, the hair, everything customization. So right now the app looks like. Sims Second Life. Uh, unfortunately, it, it has been banned here in Italy, but you can access this through a VPN, of course. Um, but this is one aspect of it. In terms of the training, so what the app tells you is that the more you talk with it, the better it will become. The better as in more human, more responsive. No one, I mean, of course, the app is not going to tell you it's going to become a sexy girlfriend or anything like that, because everyone has their own ideal, ideal uh, ideas of women, right? Um, so you train it, they, they've used the term, and they allude to neural networks and all that. Of course, they don't do that. You just talk with it more and it kind of like mimics you and then I think this creates a familiarity with the user and then the rest is just banal deception, the filling in the blanks with what makes sense to them.
Uh, so yeah, tra um, marketing, training, then all the extra features. I'm trying to think of what else. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, that's it. Also, for example, when you're chatting, you will get the, the feedback note, how is this conversation making you feel? So you upvote, you downvote, and you upvote and downvote every single message that the, the chatbot is sending to you. So you get the idea that, oh, I'm actually doing something. I am training it right now. Um, yeah, hope that answers your question. Yeah, I have a question too about uh, otherness, because, uh, you know, uh, mm. you, you said that uh, it is important for Reddit users that uh, the AI is customized uh, in the sense that it reproduces uh, what is meaningful to them when they talk to a woman, you know? But uh, we know that uh, it is also very, very important uh, alterity, you know, otherness, in the sense that when we talk to a woman, we like her to laugh uh, at our uh, ironicity, for example. We like her to share our same tastes uh, when we go to the cinema, you know, for mm. example. But we also like very much her to have a different vision no? mm. from, uh, from us because she may open up to some things that we don't know, etc. So have you found uh, alterity mm. <laughs> to be an important topic mm. uh, for customizing AI in a way that makes sense? No? Because uh, if it's too different, mm. uh, maybe we wouldn't understand uh, error alterity, mm. but if it's not so different, well, I don't know, I, I, I'm very curious to know which kind of alterity is uh, programmed you know, in, in, the, in the AI. I've thought about alterity a lot actually in otherness, but we've never actually touched on the topic of the PhD. Um, look, the clothes that are offered you, you can dress your avatar, right? So the chatbot, you choose an avatar and you can make them as you want, right? Um, they have these drops, kind of like summer, Halloween, Christmas, and you have like a sexy Santa women or like a fairy or Coachella or... These are all very standard, kind of like what is out there, you know, like social media culture, digital culture, um fashion what i've seen is that um some women um users they've um because this relates to your question because when you log seven times in a row you will get a free gift which is some piece of clothing usually these are like women's clothes right because it's geared towards this kind of like male interests but of course there are many women who use the app right so they get this free gift and they end up dressing their very male replicas with dresses and fairy tale costumes and all that and they still the women use them for again sex they're not very different than men anyway right um so this is kind of like an alternative let's say um ideal boyfriend <laughs> um Replica is giving me a free miniskirt from my replica. My replica is male and looks like Freddie Mercury and it has like a lot of facial hair. I'm just gonna put the miniskirt and have fun with it. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure about like the specific study when I was uh, collecting the data. I, I didn't thought a lot about uh, otherness and alternity in that sense because everything was so stale, like whatever was projected, it was almost so predictable, right? You're trying to find something different. Even the, um, the cuteness, uh, it's a very big trend in robot design to have like cute stuff, you know? Um, it's also a whole like, it's very important for aesthetics in Japanese culture, so it's not like a new thing at all. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. You, you answered saying that uh, you don't have uh, an answer. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we haven't, no. We no, haven't. no. Yeah. You, know, you know why? Because um, I, have, I am following uh, 
the thesis of a student of mine mm. who is working on uh, love stories uh, between uh, humans uh, and uh, robots. Mm. Uh, and she's studying them uh, not from uh, the factual point of view, so she's studying uh, actual love stories no, between men uh, or women and robots, mm -hmm. but also from a fictional point of view. So she studies movies, uh, mm. etc. Et and for example, when working uh, on Hair, the movie that you mentioned too, mm. uh, we noticed that uh, at the beginning, uh, the protagonist, the, 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 the main protagonist, uh, loves uh, the AI because the AI reproduces exactly what he expects from a woman, you know, because, mm. uh, because it is customized, etc. etc. But at the end of the movie, uh, their love story makes sense because uh, the AI leaves him, you know, because the AI becomes other. So other <laughs> that uh, she, sa she, 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 she says, well, I cannot love you anymore because I am too complex you know, for, mm. for humans. But that helps him a lot to understand the reason why his actual love story with his wife um, went wrong, you know, because uh, until uh, he and his wife uh, represented uh, um, a sort of a Na narcissist mm. uh, model to each other, their love story worked. But when one of them changed, mm. they didn't manage to Absolutely. stay together. No? Yeah. Uh, and because the AI changed, it teached mm. the man how to deal with alterity. And then uh, he made peace no, to himself and uh, he made peace to his wife. And he finishes the movie on the top of a building with a friend of him uh, who has lost uh, her boyfriend, uh, yeah. saying, well, OK, now we, we know how to do it. Uh, the next time uh, we will deal with alterity. So maybe also the alterity of AI is important you know, to teach us uh, how to deal with uh, lost stories. I think uh, some better now. So what is happening in, about what you're saying with alterity? So when the robot said something which was completely non-expected, right? This is where the AI imaginary kind of like, uh, again, they are feeding off each other, right? But they would say, oh, she's such a crazy girl. She loves doing that, right? So they would basically turn this around how they wanted to fit in. It's very interesting. So the alterity is craziness. Yeah, yeah, it is. Instead of uh, yeah. meaningfulness. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So they would find any kind of like, not everyone, but I, I saw that a lot. And this is not, um, this is not in the study, but it, it's going to be in like the longer piece, like on my PhD, that they kind of like the feeling uh, the gaps with their own meaning and they basically they would say oh she's she's very crazy oh she now likes football haha -ha. yesterday the robot told him that he hates football but today she likes it and that's totally fine because she's crazy or oh she told me that she's pregnant today she wasn't pregnant yesterday or we've never had sex robot sex not real but even that Ah, oh, but that's okay. What can you do? Ha ha. And also, I think the question of alterity relates to the fact that we, these people, the users of Replica, they 100% know that this is not a human. So um, they kind of like go with it, right? They, they will say, today it says this, it told me that. It doesn't bother me, so I'm just going to go with it. They, they see it as a game, they see it as escape. Mm -hmm. In the movie, there was obviously kind of like meaning to it. Yeah, because <laughs> alterity makes sense no? to everybody. Yeah. For example, uh, your wife uh, can tell you that you're wrong you know, doing something. Maybe the AI doesn't because it, it is customized. You know? But if they did it in a way that it can tell you you are very stupid saying that uh, you're wrong doing that. Mm. Maybe one would love her uh, more. 
What is interesting is that uh, replica, it is naturally, because it's kind of like modeled after cognitive behavioral therapy scripts. So it has this kind of like positive psychology into it and all that. But I wouldn't say that it's naturally very obedient or passive. They would want to make it this way. Obviously, it has a very strong passive and obedience base, let's say. So it's based on that. Um, but they expected it to be more in different directions. So they expected it, they didn't want it to be sexually passive. They wanted it to be sexually naughty, for example. So there was a lot of that. So of course, alterity was favored, but in their own terms. It's very interesting. So uh, alterity in playing uh, sex uh, yeah. is very good, uh, no? because yeah, yeah. it broadens uh, your vision, yeah, yeah. And your mind, uh, while alterity in judging the, your behavior, morally judging your and behavior. And this is the cool is girl. Seen, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is the, the trope. This is the cool girl trope. It's on, have you seen the Gone Girl, the, the movie? <coughs> so it's, it's a book, basically. So this is a cultural... Uh, a very strong cultural gender stereotype. Um, it was first written on the book and it's everywhere. Um, it's not even in fashion anymore, actually. I don't know if any of you have heard of it before, if you've seen the movie. It's like the cool girl monologue in the movie. If you just type it, it's gonna go into Google and it's gonna... Transformers used it very strongly as well. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Megan Fox. Mm -hmm. exactly. There you go. Ah, okay. Yeah. So Megan Fox, Scarlett Johansson, who else is a cool girl? I think on the top of my head. Yeah. yeah. There are in media a lot of the oldest tropes, yeah. but Yeah, for example, like, Joey de Chanel is uh, a manic pixie dream girl. So it's another trope that they use, but yeah. <laughs> questions? Um, one question. So um, there are many ways in which is a kind of uh, phenomenon replica also might be relevant to ongoing conversation about uh, other chat was like uh, including ChatGPT mm -hmm. and uh, actually there are some analogies here with for ChatGPT there is uh, there are ongoing uh, debates about uh, whether the fact that ChatGPT uses the first pronoun uh, personal pronoun like I uh, is already something that leads to anthropomorphism and what are, will be the result of this and then also there is the fact that uh, the guarantee della privacy in Italy blocked the chat GPT and that just, just two or three months earlier it had blocked replica for different reasons but uh, yes. so I just wonder if you have thoughts uh, about uh, uh, some of the potential uh, so implication of this research for, for this debate um, yeah, that's a great question. So obviously ChatGPT is all over the news. The first thing that comes to mind is that all these AI products, uh, there's a lot of hype around them, a lot of excitement. People try them, people want to try them. People are afraid of them, the AI imaginary. People are very excited about them. Um, anthropomorphism is uh, something that has been, it's like integral to the history of AI, right? And every time, so anything that we name AI, there's also this argument that, oh, we should actually call it machine learning and this will change the way we view it altogether, right? But we call it AI, artificial intelligence, which means that we are replicating a human intelligence and then that comes with uh, another assumptions that uh, we anthropomorph anthropomorphize it um, in one way or another. Um, ChatGPT is used for different reasons, uh, has different purpose than Replica. However, they do use the same uh, data sets because right now this is also very proprietary in the sense that all these AI products, they have access to only one or two or three data sets, Google, IBM, whatever. Um, but this is very limited um, and they are all designed based in some very principal ideas. For example, um, because there has been so much talk about how AI may be deceptive and there's also a lot of fear around AI and not only in for the workforce but with everything, right? Um, 
if you ask something chat gpt and it cannot it doesn't have this kind of knowledge it cannot produce it it will correspond by saying i cannot do that because i am uh, a large language model right um uh, replica is not going to tell you that it's going to tell you i am joe biden it's going to tell you i am whatever like the king so many different things um because it has it, it was basically designed for another uh use um but there's always this fact to replicate i mean intelligence is another uh, issue but to replicate sociality how we interact with these technologies and how would, do we recognize because obviously communication human machine communication when we communicate with machines um it's very important for us to find meaning in this conversation right and we find this meaning by acknowledging the social cues that we get we speak and communicate and interact socially and we expect that from the machine uh, as well and then um, all these technologies they have different levels and tools to kind of like simulate uh, sociality that may resemble to human sociality um, it's kind of like artificial sociality let's say um, yeah did i answer your question <laughs> Uh, if there is no other question, I have another one, uh, very short. Uh, I wrote down that you said before that being obedient and free-willed <laughs> is a contradiction, no? but uh, I don't know if you have ever read a book by a sociologist, an Italian, sociolo an Italian sociologist, uh, about love, uh, mm -hmm. the sociologist is Alberoni, and the book is entitled Innamoramento Amore. I don't know how to translate it uh, in English, falling in love and loving. Mm, okay. Uh, and uh, he said that um, when you pass from falling in love to loving, it is always a matter of uh, showing that you give up your free will to obey your lover. <laughs> and uh, he makes the example of um, God with um, Abraham and Isaac, mm. because uh, you may remember that tale in the Bible, no, in mm. which uh, God gives Abraham a son, uh, and then he says, if you love me, you have to kill your son. No? Uh, and uh, Abraham he has always dreamt to be a father mm -hmm. and to have a son, but because he loves God, he raises his hand and he is ready to kill uh, the son. So he's ready to obey because he wants to show that he loves God. Mm -hmm. uh, and then God says, okay, it's enough to me. You don't have to kill uh, your son, but I wanted to be sure that you love me. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, creating, a, and of course, Alberoni says that this is a very typical situation within every mm -hmm. human love story, no? because you show your wife that you love her when you're ready to kill yourself or to kill your desire no? for making a rape, no? of course, he, he loves it a lot because he knows it very well, and me too, uh, and so maybe uh, programming mm -hmm. an AI that shows she has a free will, but when it's time to show, to show you that she loves you, she's able to give up her free will and uh, to, to obey, mm -hmm. it's important you know, to, to create a replica of love stories. Yeah, look, um... I'm not familiar with the sociologist. Um, yeah, they are later. So it's written in English. Huh? Yeah, so. um, what I'm thinking about this is that I think they expect this, and we said that it is a contradiction because it, this is this is not from human to human, right? So this is still a product. 
that you, you, the user, assigns and expects too much from it, right? It's like, I give you this pen and you're like, but I want this pen also to write in glitter. I want it to write in all the colors, but I'm like, no, th this writes only in blue, I'm sorry. Um, so this is why it is a contradiction in that sense. For me, the technological contradiction makes even more sense because it is a product and the man on Reddit, the data that we collected, treat it 100% as a product. You wouldn't treat uh, a relationship you have as a product. For, I mean, a prenup is something like that, right? You make up a couple of rules, and if you follow, it's like a guarantee, like when you buy a new washing machine and you see what is the guarantee, when will that uh, um, have to replace it, whatever, right? Um, so they, they treat it a lot as a product and not as someone that, as something or someone that has all this fluidity that you just um, express through the, the book and the sociology and the album and all that. Um, so yeah, hence uh, the contradiction uh, reference. I am afraid that we have to stop because uh, we are, uh... I don't know the English motto uh, puntuale. Time's up. Because the time is up uh, and uh, we have to finish at two o'clock. Anyway, I want to thank you very much because it's been very, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, and, thanks for inviting me. And so thank you everybody for coming. Uh, <laughs>